Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is Session 9, Part 1 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue a discussion about God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, introducing and discussing God's creation of the human conscience, how it operates, why it was created, and the role the conscience plays in the processes of forgiveness and repentance. The session was recorded on the 26th of December 2017 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. Welcome back, everyone. Today we are filming session nine in a series on forgiveness and repentance. Jesus and I have been working our way through this discussion. And today we're going to be introducing to you the human conscience, <laughs> what that is, how it operates and um, what its purpose is, what its purpose is in our life. And soon we're going to learn how that relates to forgiveness and repentance. But today we're just going to focus very strongly on what is the human conscience. So yes. welcome. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion a lot because it this kind of material, we've discussed it a lot with people sort of in ad hoc conversations, which have never been recorded. But, you know, this is probably the first time we've discussed it in a recording session. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, this information is going to be uh, quite new or, or new altogether, actually. And uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see how everyone responds to it. Yeah. Mm. Let's review sessions one to eight in the series on forgiveness and repentance. So, so far we've, we've had uh, already eight sessions yeah. and we've been, we've been working our way, haven't we, through a lot of preliminary information so that eventually, right at the end, we're going to address some very specific questions from our viewers. Yes, and that's, that's necessary. I've got something in my there. That's necessary because if we, if we um, don't um, present all this preliminary information, when it comes to answering the questions about forgiveness and repentance in terms of how it looks and how you, how you deal with it in your day-to-day -day life, no one's really going to understand the answers without understanding all of these different concepts that we we're introducing beforehand. So that's why we've had to do such a long-winded discussion about the whole issue. <laughs> and, and it is one of the God's uh, most highest laws, of course. So the laws pertaining to forgiveness and repentance all revolve around laws of love. And they, as such, they are the highest laws of actually redeeming the soul. And because of that, it, obviously, there are some complexities that need to be examined and also some understanding that we need to gather if we really want to have some kind of progress when it comes to letting go of the damage that's inside of our soul. Mm. So to that end, in the first uh, three sessions in this series, mm -hmm. we discussed a lot about uh, the truth about God's laws, how to dis dis discover God's truth about anything. And then we focused on the truth about forgiveness and repentance. Hmm. Yes. And then and then we in a, a brief, a brief. This is, of course, just a brief review because we don't want to be too long winded with the reviews now. And um, but in sessions four to to eight, this one, uh, yeah. this uh, yeah, until last week, yeah. the last time we, we got together with everyone, it's session eight, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And so four to eight, five sessions, we discussed the law of compensation. And, and during that discussion, we discussed a lot of things about the law of compensation, how that actually works, what effect it has on the soul. What it, we looked at the analogy of sowing and reaping in detail so that we could get some kind of a picture of what it means to sow and what it means to reap and in kind and, and uh, commensurate or, or in proportion mm -hmm. and so forth, or not, not trying to reap what you haven't sown at all. Yeah. And we examined all of those principles about com compensation. Now we needed to do that because we needed to establish why certain things needed to be repented for mm -hmm. and why other things that people have done to us need to be forgiven because obviously they do have quite strong emotional effects on us uh, that enter our soul that need to be released. Mm. Mm. So now in sessions 9, 10 and 11, we're in session 9 today, we're going to be introducing what is the conscience, uh, really having the chance to explain that in a, in a quite detailed way. 
And then we're going to work through the different ways that the conscience is misunderstood or mm -hmm. understood and misunderstood on earth today mm -hmm. in the next session. And then finally, we'll get on to linking that all back to forgiveness and repentance again. Yes, because yeah. we need to know the relationship between the conscience, the laws of compensation, and also uh, with the laws of forgiveness and repentance and how it all works together and how, mm -hmm. how it's all being motivated to, or how we are being motivated to eventually enter the process of forgiveness and repentance. Because mm -hmm. there is a lot of misconception on the planet, isn't there? Like a lot of times when we're engaging or feeling the effects of, say, compensation. A lot of us can, might confuse that with uh, our conscience. Uh, sometimes we might think we're even engaging with repentance when it's just our conscience, you know, signaling something to us. So it's really good to discuss and elaborate on all of these things so that we can be mm. really clear about what forgiveness and repentance really is and what it is not. Yes, and there is a, a, a common theme about the conscience that we would like to discuss in these sessions that where people believe that uh, because they feel guilt or shame, that's their conscience. Mm -hmm. And that's not actually their conscience that's mm. uh, causing those particular things, those particular feelings. Those feelings come from within a person based on their emotional injuries. And, and uh, internally, we need to understand the mechanism of the conscience and its purpose. And then we'll understand how wonderful it is. It's, got, it's such a wonderful, beautiful uh, provision of God. In fact, uh, com in comparison to God's love, the conscience is a, is a very important tool that God uses to communicate with all of his children. So it's a very important thing for us to understand how it all works and how it all fits together. And, uh, and by the way, with all of these particular things, we need to remember that we're using the word conscience because that's the human word that's been invented mm -hmm. for it. And, and so that's why we're using the word. Bear in mind that God doesn't have specific words for these particular mechanisms, but we have invented words so that people can relate to what we're speaking about. Yeah. Introduction to the human conscience. So let's give a brief intro here on what we're going to talk about today and the significance. Obviously, we'll get into far more depth as the discussion goes on, mm -hmm. but if you can just uh, lay some groundwork for us. Yeah, well, before we engage the process of forgiveness and repentance, if you think about it, we really need to know what's true, what's right and what's false, what's mm -hmm. wrong. And if we look at right and wrong, not from the perspective of, uh, of, an, of an emotional perspective, like, you know, naughty girl, you did something <laughs> wrong, or good girl, you did something right type of thing, but rather from this perspective of what is the truth and what is not true, what is the error, then we can see that uh, we need to really know what the truth is before we have something to repent for with, mm -hmm. about our own behaviour. What is the truth about our own behaviour before we have something to repent for? And, be, and to forgive another person for whatever they have done, we first need to know God's truth about their behaviour as well. So, and so the conscience is not, not just a mechanism, though, to allow us to do that. The conscience has many other roles besides the role of trying to help us to determine what is true and what is not true. It, it helps us in a personal level. Mm -hmm. It also helps us determine what is true and what is not true in a universal level. So in other words, it's a mechanism via which we can receive truth about the universe that, around, that surrounds us and how we interact with that universe. So the conscience is a, actually a much bigger mechanism than the mo most people on earth would give it credit for. So, so in this particular discussion, we need to um, look at things like, well, what is the, what is the conscience? You know, defining what it actually is. And then we need to examine how it operates and also why God created. Why, why did God do it? Why did God create this conscience? And what does it help me do in my relationship with God? We need to understand all of those things. But even if we decide to not have a relationship with God, the conscience plays a, piv plays a pivotal role in our lives mm -hmm. if we let it. And we can, uh, the conscience is under our control as well as being under God's control. It's a part of our soul that has able to, re it's a receptor. And we'll talk about that more in our, in our future discussion. Mm -hmm. But before we really get involved in the discussion as well, we need to remind our listeners about some basic things about truth, love, laws, and 
you know, how we and how we operate emotionally, because all of those things play a part in conscience and they also all play a part in the process of forgiveness and repentance. So basically you're saying this conscience that we haven't yet defined is very significant in that it's going to help us to discern what is true and what is not mm -hmm. uh, personally and universally. Mm -hmm. But before we get into defining it, we're going to have to have some reminders about other things uh, that we've established about the way the human soul operates and God's love and God's truth so that we can give good context to the definition that's coming. Correct. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> reminders about God's truth. And really here we're talking about reminders about God's truth as it relates to the human conscience, aren't we? Well, not, not just as it relates to the human conscience, it's uh, as it relates to all things. Um, because it, like, for, let's look at some basic uh, attributes or qualities of God's truth. The first thing is it's absolute. In other words, it, it knows exactly what is true and what is true is established and there is only one truth. And, and that's the case with every aspect of our existence. If you drill down into it, there is only one truth which can be expanded upon or simplified to a degree but it is still one truth mm -hmm. in terms of what we're, what we're explaining. So God's truth is absolute. That's one of its qualities or, or one of its attributes. God's truth is always emotional in that, in that since truth opens our soul to love, it actually has an emotional effect on us. It, 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 it impacts us emotionally. So, so if truth, if you're listening to truth and it's only having an intellectual impact on you, then you're not really receiving truth yet, mm -hmm. right? When, when the truth really hits you, it hits you in your heart and it motivates you to act upon it. And that's one of the qualities of God's truth as well. So, so far it's absolute and it's emotional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we also see that God's truth or any truth can only be discovered if we have a passionate desire to receive it. So, so if you sort of a lackadaisical attitude, a laissez-faire type of attitude in life, then it's highly likely you're not going to receive much truth throughout your life. Mm -hmm. Although all of God's laws and principles are all designed to expose truth to you, it depends to a large degree on your desire to notice it as to whether you will notice it and then act upon it. Mm -hmm. So that's an important factor as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also the factor is, uh, that I feel that most people forget with truth because we're, we're so tied into this concept of, uh, what would you call it? We're, most people on earth are scared of truth, are frightened of it. But truth is fascinating. Like, <laughs> there's no other word for it. It, 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 it. it can fascinate and beguile us, in fact. And, and God's created it to do that, to, to, to draw us into its web, if you like, of, of information and knowledge. And God's created our soul in such a way that we have this passionate desire to engage it. And we see children, you see children doing that quite a lot. You know, why this and why that? Why daddy? Why mummy? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And unfortunately, as parents, most parents tend to shut down the child from this kind of it, it like fascinating discovery process. Mm -hmm. But truth is a fascinating discovery process. Every new truth, and God's designed truth to be this way, this fascinating process of discovery. Mm -hmm. And if you really engage the process of searching for God's truth, you will always be fascinated <laughs> and quite passionate about the process. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Then it also promotes freedom, because if you think about it from a law perspective, if I know the law of gravity, then I don't have that as much freedom as if I know the law and I understand the law of aerodynamics as well as the law of gravity. Now that I understand the two laws and I understand the principles of aerodynamics, I can fly, which also helps me to overcome to an extent the law of gravity. So truth gives me more freedom. And it's always the case. The more you learn, the more free you become, the, the more easy your life becomes and the more fascinating your life becomes and more enjoyable it becomes. And you can do things faster as a result of truth. Mm -hmm. Truth is the cause of that. You know, knowing the truth is the cause of that. And then, of course, uh, it expands our capacity to understand everything the truth does. So and therefore it expands our capacity to do everything, including to love mm -hmm. without understanding truth and having an expanding, ever expanding capacity for truth, we would never have an ever expanding capacity for love. 
So truth is like, in a way, you could compare it at, or liken it to the doorway to love, the, <laughs> the way to get to love. Mm -hmm. and, and so these are very fascinating aspects of truth that we need to bear in mind. Most people, when we talk about truth, they go, oh, no, not truth again. And that is an indication that there's some old injuries emotionally still existing within the soul that preventing people from seeing this fascinating and beautiful aspect of truth, which uh, is only there for our enjoyment in the end. Mm. Yeah. So, so really what you just described is the truth from God's perspective. From God, this is how God sees truth. It's this wonderful doorway to things. It's fascinating. It's exciting. It promotes freedom. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously it's very important to our happiness and God views it as something very important to our happiness. Very much so. So it kind of makes sense then that God wants us to know it. <laughs> of course. Now, now, if you think about that logically, you'd have to go, well, if God wants us to know it, then surely he's provided a mechanism via which we can know it. Some kind of truth receptor, if you like, yeah. inside of us that allows us to know and understand truth. And that receptor, as we'll find later on, is called our conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, the human conscience is this receptor. It's, a, it's like an antenna, you could say, almost, yep. in tune with God's voice about all matters, not just our personal lives and not just our personal condition, but on all matters, everything universal and personal. Mm. So it, it includes everything. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to understand that, that, that God created a mechanism via which we can receive truth, even if we do not have a relationship with God. Yeah, and so that's something that you've never really spoken about publicly before. Not probably, no. No, this idea that God, God has a way of giving us truth that is not about the reception of God's love, and it is not through observation, it's a direct yes. line. Yes, and if you think about it, it's a bit like a parent with a child that it doesn't yet have a, a relationship with because the child has not yet developed love for the parent. The child is learning information from the parent. So the parent has a method of communicating truthful information or unfortunately with the parent, case of a parent often untruthful information mm -hmm. to the child. Now God, it would make sense, God being a much greater parent would have a method, have designed a method that would allow God to give communication to his children, all mm -hmm. of his children. Rather than, so rather than children foundering around in the dark, as the saying goes, they would have the capacity to just go to the source of their life and go to the source of their soul, the person who created them, and say, what's this and what's that? And then get answers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the mechanism of the soul. And I suppose, though, similar to it in that analogy where a child might be developing and they might not yet have the cognition or the, the developed brain enough to understand a very intricate answer, there's also a similarity in our relationship with reception of God's truth, isn't there? That's correct. In that we have to, um, we can receive some truth from God right now, but some truth we're only going to be open to receive and understand as different emotions leave us. Mm -hmm. And also as we've received some of God's love that mm. sort of lays the found, a new foundation for further truth. Yes, and it might be more even more correct to say that um, you can go through a gradual place of receiving more truth based and, and base it on the foundation of previous truthful knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of receiving more truth. But you, if you continue that method only, to, you'll only progress to the sixth sphere of the spirit world. You can't progress beyond that point unless your soul changes inside. Now, what triggers the soul transformation from the perfect natural man into the divine is the reception of God's love. And the reception of God's love is necessary to understand every truth above the sixth dimension or the sixth sphere of the spirit world. So, so we could say love does do things to the soul which causes the soul's potential capacity to grow in its ability to receive more truth, but the love itself doesn't cause the receiving of more truth. We still need to have this passionate desire for it and, and this mm -hmm. desire to investigate it. But the love does transform the soul 
into a state where we're capable of understanding it. Mm. And this is the thing with a lot of God's truth. Unless you've received some of God's love, you are not capable of emotionally understanding the truth you're receiving. Mm. But before that time, God is obviously delivering to you the introductory foundation of truth. And he's always attempting to do that with all of his children. Because it, it sort of seems to me that there's a there's a kind of a dance that truth and love are doing in, in a way mm -hmm. in that more truth makes us more open to love and then more love makes us open to more truth and and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, it's probably not right to say the more love opens us to more truth. It is right to say that truth opens us to love. Uh -huh. But it's probably not right to say that love opens us to truth. What love does is it transforms the soul into a new creature that's capable of absorbing different kinds, uh, higher kinds of truth. So it, it enables the reception of more truth. It yes. still doesn't ensure it. That's because right. we must seek it. That's right. But it's it's sort of opening uh, us to be able to receive a new level, to understand and comprehend a new level of truth. Yes, and it also is very dependent on comprehension. Like um, a person who's intellectually seeking more truth will get to a point where their mind can not comprehend anything anymore mm -hmm. uh, of what's being offered. You know, it can still comprehend all of the past things mm -hmm. that, that, that it's received. But the new things above the sixth sphere, the, the things pertaining to the soul based uh, actions of truth that we need to come to understand at some point in our future, the mind is not capable of understanding it without without the soul being transformed mm. so and, and without the mind being absorbed by the soul in in a lot of ways now god's love transforms the soul it, it, into this new creature that allows the potential of new truth entering it mm -hmm. but it doesn't guarantee new truth will enter it yes <laughs> for new truth to enter it there still has to be a desire this other mechanism this desire to connect to the mechanism God's provided to for us to receive truth from God. And that is, mechanism is the conscience. All right. Mm. Remind us about God's love. So here I'd like to ask a question. We've just had some reminders about God's truth and we spoke a little about God's love. This question is, is receiving, is receiving God's love the fastest and most efficient way of receiving God's truth? Mm. So we have kind of answered this question in the previous section, but let's talk some more about it. Yes. Yeah, so, so let's state categorically, receiving God's love is not a method of receiving God's truth at all. Receiving God's love is only a method of receiving God's love. <laughs> when you receive God's love, it does transform the soul's ability to receive truth by building or growing the soul into a different creature. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. But it doesn't guarantee the reception of truth. So, so while God's love can transform the soul to allow the soul to receive more truth, there is still no guarantee that it will receive more truth. The mechanism is that God's truth must be received first, right? In most cases, in fact, God's truth had to be received first before any of us received God's love. Mm. In other words, we had to know that God's love existed, which is a truth. Mm -hmm. And we had to know that God wanted to give us her love, which is also another truth. And we had to know that our soul was capable of receiving it, which is another truth. And we had to know how to ask for it, which is about desire for it. And that's another truth before the love could flow. So mm -hmm. there were a whole series of truths that had to happen in the soul before the soul could receive God's love. And those truths had to hit the soul in such a way that it created within the soul a desire to actually engage those truths, to actually live them. Mm -hmm. And once the soul engaged to live them, now the soul can engage the process of truth, which will open it to receiving God's love. So that's how we receive God's love. It's not the love doesn't prepare us for truth. The love, you could say, grows the soul and the desires of the soul are able then to be exercised to absorb higher truths. But at some point we need to exercise a desire for truth before 
we even knew about God's love at all. Mm. Mm. Okay, so uh, just a few clarifiers about that. Um, clearly, it's possible to just seek truth, seek truth, seek truth, and never uh, seek love. And I feel many people on earth do that. Yes. You no, know, there are many sincere people on earth, in, particularly in different fields of endeavor. You see, yep. particularly in scientific fields of endeavor, where people are seeking more truth, seeking more truth, seeking more truth. And that's, they're using their intellect to do so most of the time. Uh, and they, you know, many times not connected to God while they're doing it, but they do have an attitude of desiring more truth because they know that every new truth they discover will benefit them and others. Mm -hmm. right? So there's plenty of people who have that desire. Yes. And there's plenty of people who, uh, myself included, who feel far more comfortable um, uh, opening ourselves up to God's truth than we do to God's love. Mm -hmm even emotionally opening ourselves to God's truth and not to God's love. That's right. So that's why this question kind of came about, mm -hmm. because there's also this other thing that can happen, and I'd like to ask you to explain what is occurring when this happens. When, say, I open myself up to receiving love, so I long for love and I feel it. Let's say it's not from God in this case, just from you. I, I receive your love and suddenly it feels like in that moment as I'm receiving your love I realize wow all these other people who said that they loved me I realize now that wasn't real love or I realize now there was so many problems in that relationship and it seems like suddenly truth I know more truth mm -hmm. about the nature of love about the nature of relationships about some things that happened in my past Mm -hmm. So it can feel like receiving love brings me truth. Mm -hmm. What's actually happening in that dynamic? Well, there, there's a number of discrete operations that are occurring before the truth actually enters, even though it may seem instantaneous to the person at okay. the time. The discrete operations are you opened firstly through desire. So you had to have some faith. Mm -hmm. You open through this desire, uh, desire for love. You let that love enter you. So to do that, you had to soften yourself, you soften your heart. You have to to receive love. So you softened your heart and you receive some of it. Now, in the softening of the heart, you automatically became a bit more humble. Uh -huh. Now, in the process of, hu of humility, it's highly likely that you will release some emotion. And the emotion that was being released was this contrast, the feeling of contrast between the love you're now being offered, which you could feel is more like um, what would, what would you call it, more real, sincere, mm -hmm. um, compared to the so-called love that you'd been offered in the past, which mm -hmm. is very much about taking uh, selfishly motivated. Mm -hmm. That causes emotional reaction inside of a person. Yes. And the emotional reaction is, wow, what a big contrast between that and this. Yep. And, and, and if you allow those emotions, which you probably will do because you remember you've softened your heart now, yeah. You'll probably have some cries about it and everything. And in the process of crying about those particular things, you'll realize a lot of truth about love that you didn't know before. Yes. Now, what actually happened? Did the love open your heart or did you open your heart to love? <laughs> yes. And love as it entered you transformed you enough to be humble to releasing some of the emotional experiences of the past, yep. the errors, if you like, of the past mm -hmm. to such an extent that you now see a new truth. Mm. So you're saying that inherently in that process, I have sought new truth. It's not that it's just come inherent in the love experience. I, I, well, in this case, in the example you gave, yep. I would say you sought love, mm -hmm. which is a great thing to do. And that's the beauty of seeking love. Yep. Is see, in the, beauty of, the beauty of seeking love is that it does soften your heart and it opens you up to release of emotion, which, ha which has been preventing you from understanding truth in the past. Mm -hmm. So that it does have that operation. Love does have the operation of, of, as it enters you, softening you. And now you're open to experiencing emotions you were not open to experiencing before. And those emotions, while you had them within you, were preventing you from absorbing or listening to truth. Mm -hmm. So naturally now, after you've released those emotions, you are now more open to that truth. So there is, like you say, a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between love and truth. But we need to be careful about saying that love is the thing that causes me to receive new truth. 
no, it's not, because you can receive new truths yep. without receiving love. So <laughs> Yes. So, so let's go back to three things. The first analogy or the first scenario I gave where we're constantly seeking God's truth, seeking God's truth, but we're remaining blocked to God's love. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, as we've discussed in our previous section, there's a limit to how much of God's truth I'm going to be able to understand in that state. Because, because of the soul's lack of growth. Yes. That's yeah. the important point. So I can only grow so far. Correct. You can yeah. only grow so far by developing your intellect and developing your intellectual state. You, Even your, aren't I also emotionally opening God's sure, truth? Sure, but in you that can process. only grow so much emotionally yep. without God. Yes. You know, beyond a certain point, you cannot go without God's love entering you and transforming your soul. So, so emotionally and intellectually, you can only grow to a certain point by yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first scenario. Yep. We're seeking, we're opening our heart even to God's truth, but not to God's love. Then in the second scenario we just spoke about where I soften my heart and I open myself to love, God's love, let's say, and this kicks off a whole process inside of me where new truth is sort of almost seems like it's revealed. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm making shifts inside of me. It's probably more appropriate to say the truth now is able to be revealed mm -hmm. because of the growth of the heart. The yes. heart, the soul, if you yeah. like, has now grown in capacity, its capacity to receive it. Mm -hmm. And so now it can be shared with you quite readily. Quite easily. Mm. And we've already said that it's the truth is not within the love or anything. There still has to be an independent process going on. But that softening to the love does then create this other uh, yes. capacity. And it's important to state, though, that, that all operations of love are truthful. Mm -hmm. And all operations of truth, are God's absolute truth, are loving. Yes. Because there is this symbiotic relationship between those two principles of God, the principle of truth and the principle of love. So, so we can't divorce them so much from each other. But here we are saying we are capable of receiving truth without receiving love to a certain point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if we circle right the way back to our question, which was, is receiving God's love the fastest and most efficient way of receiving God's truth? We're saying, it sounds like you're saying, well, it's not necessarily so that you're going to receive God's truth if you receive God's love, but well, it does well, sound like it's faster. No, but what I'm saying is uh, there's a point of semantics here, really. Right, okay. And that is, that receiving God's love is not a way of receiving God's truth. It's uh -huh. not a way yes. of receiving God's truth. Yes. What it does, it does do things to the soul that makes the reception of God's truth much easier, certainly. <laughs> and faster. And faster and, and, okay. and, and, more, and more rapid. But it is not a way of receiving God's truth. Mm -hmm. The way it makes receiving God's truth more rapid mm -hmm. is by transforming the soul's capacity to understand truth. <laughs> That's the only way it does it. Yeah. And we still need to have a desire for that truth before we can receive it. Okay. Right. So, so it's more a point of semantics here about all or definitions, if you like. Mm -hmm. If we believe that receiving God's love is all we need to do to understand truth, then that is not true. Yep. Because while the capacity, if you receive God's love, to first receive God's love firstly, you must be in harmony to a certain degree of truth already. Mm -hmm. And how do you get into harmony when you haven't received the love? <laughs> the only way to get into harmony is by receiving the truth through a different mechanism. Yes. Right. So we need to understand that God's love isn't the way of receiving truth. God's love transforms the soul's ability or potential to receive mm -hmm. truth, which is a very different thing. Yes. All right. And we need to understand that de delicate but very important difference mm. between the two qualities of God. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I put this question in here because we're about to start into a discussion where we understand that there's a mechanism for receiving truth and there's a mechanism for receiving love. Mm -hmm. And I feel more comfortable just receiving truth. So I might just give up on receiving love. <laughs> well, and if that's your goal, then you can do that. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I guess, I guess um, knowing what I do and knowing what you say, uh, also I can see that if we receive God's love, 
then every capacity of the conscience will only be heightened. Of course, but there's also another factor. Yeah. If we're choosing to receive God's truth or truth, absolute truth, mm -hmm. but not choosing to receive God's love, then surely it would indicate that we have some major sadnesses about, about love, love. Definitely. that we need to work on. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's all that really indicates. Why would you not want to receive love yeah. and instead just choose to receive truth if you knew and believed love was available to you? Yeah. You know, of course, love is what uh, truth provides happiness to a degree, mm -hmm. but love provides bliss. <laughs> you know, because it, it's, it's an actual experience of love yeah. that provides that provides the bliss. And and why would you not want to engage the process of receiving love? There can only be emotional reasons why that the truth will help you expose. Mm. As it does. <laughs> As it does. So, yeah. so the beauty of it is that let's say initially you're quite blocked to love and you don't and you decide there's no such thing as God's love and there's no such thing as receiving God's love. There's probably no such thing as God at all, let's say, you know, that's how many people see it today. At least while you're receiving God's truth, the absolute truth about different things, at some point in your future, you will become aware that it is possible to receive love mm -hmm. from people, but also possible that there is a God that you can receive love from too. Yeah. And, and this is the beauty of the truth. The beauty of the truth is it exposes the potentials available to you and then you can personally choose yeah. what you're going to do with that. Now, the love does not expose the potentials. The truth does. The love, when it comes, gives you the happiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the truth can to a degree, but, but you know, the love is the thing that completes your happiness. So, so, so the two do go hand, hand in hand, but we cannot specifically state, and, and it's wrong to state, that the love is a way to open you to God's truth. Yeah. It's not a way to God's truth. It, it, it transforms your soul's abilities to receive God's truth, which is a very different mechanism. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Reminders about God's laws and the design of the human soul. So now we're moving on to our third set of reminders um, before we start our discussion of the human conscience. Mm -hmm. And here we wanted to look at basically the context that the soul, the soul exists in and how that's going to relate to our later discussions. So. Yeah. So in our assistance groups, we learned that the God's principles uh, are a part of God's nature, that God, uh, as a part of God's character, attributes and nature, God has principles by which God lives, you could say, by which God engages his interactions with the universe. Now, God decided to create the universe, but before God did that, he had to create a structure in which the universe could exist. And that structure is called laws. So God created a whole series of laws, which are the structure, the, you could say the framework of the universe. And then he placed the materials, he created the, the universe itself, the materials inside of the universe. And the soul, the human soul, is the highest of those materials, if you like. Mm -hmm, yeah. The highest because it has, it is the only one of the creations of God that has free will, the ability to be a free thinking, free acting being without there being some other external controls on the, on the being. And, and it has the ability to be self-aware. It has self-knowledge that can grow uh, over periods of time. In addition, the human soul has the ability to transform mm -hmm. from its natural condition into the divine angel. So the human soul has been created with very special, unique qualities. And God's laws had to be created that would allow the human soul to do things, yeah. to interact in certain ways. So we need to understand that Every one of God's laws now, as we learnt also in our assistance group, every one of God's laws has an energy measurement system yep. in it. And it's capable of measuring the energy flows of all sorts and types of energy, including thoughts, feelings, words, actions, desires, intentions and so forth that are all human, yep. that, that are governed by the human soul. So, so it has the ability now, so God created a whole series of structures, laws, 
and God created the human soul with the ability to have flows of energy and the laws measure and respond to the flows of energy and the types and kinds of energy that are flowing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is now a system in place that God's got where where you've got laws governing uh, the human soul and its operation itself, but also the laws measure things that the human soul creates. Yes. And those creations of the human soul can be measured and quantified and reacted upon yeah. by the universe that surrounds the soul. Mm-hmm. So this is the system God created, very, very clever system, as most people who were at the group or have listened to that material would understand now. It's a very clever system to help uh, us live in a framework of constant change and upgrade, if you like, yeah. uh, without there being any lack of safety. So yes. it's a, it creates a safe system, a happy system for humans. And in addition to that, we also spoke at that group um, about the capacity inherent that God has created inherently in the human soul and through the design of the laws that energy or information can be transmitted from God to the human soul and from the human soul to God. Yes. Now, in the group, we learned that the God is uh, outside of, or you could say, in, you know, encompassing the entire mm-hmm. universe. God is bigger than the entire universe, but God is outside of the universe. And we are, as human souls, inside the universe. We, we currently exist inside. Now, we don't know whether that's always going to be the case, given uh-huh. the transformations that the soul may be possible of, capable, yeah, capable of carrying yep. out yep. with the help of God's love. However, at this stage, that's the limitation. Now, there had to be a mechanism that God also created that Mm -hmm. allowed God to transmit love, which we learned at our group, to transmit love from God's soul to the human soul so that there could be a free flow of communication between uh, between God and the human soul. And if you think about it, there must also be a way that God has to transmit truth to the human soul so that there can be a free flow of information of truth coming from God. The knowledge, uh, all the knowledge of the universe exists in God and uh, God wants to share all that knowledge as a gift to humanity. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a way for God to share that truth with humanity. And the mechanism via which God's created that truth is the conscience in the first part Yep. And the second part is by receiving God's love. Because remember, some of the truths of the universe we're not capable of understanding yep. unless we've received the transformative uh, actions or, or results of God's love. Yep. So, so you can see that God provided both mechanisms in order for us to be completely happy and to be, be transformed everlastingly. You know, as a, as, and eventually, once we're an immortal being, who, who has received God's love to the point of obtaining immortality, we obviously will have an engaging life of learning still. Mm-hmm. So all of those things must still occur. Yes. In order for us to continue learning and, and seeing and experiencing more of our universe. Yes. All right. Mm. So we are definitively saying that there's almost two mechanisms. We've learnt about the laws of divine love a lot from you, mm-hmm. uh, which allow the transmission of God's love. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we understand there has that has special implications for the further reception of truth. But what we are trying to establish in this discussion is that there's another mechanism that we haven't spoken about formally before, which is the human conscience. And that is a mechanism via which God transmits truth. Yes. And it's not like we haven't discussed this, actually. I've just discussed it using different terminology. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, I've said quite frequently that you must first understand that God's love exists before you can desire to feel it. You must understand how you go about praying, how you go about receiving that love, opening up the desire of your heart to receive that love. Now, these are truths Mm -hmm. which the conscience can confirm Mm -hmm. (laughs) before you've even received God's love if you were open to receiving the knowledge that came from God directly through the conscience. Yes. And, and so the opera, even all the operation, the basic operation of the laws involved with that govern the reception of God's love can all be confirmed through the operation of the conscience. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we just need to then engage them. And, yes. <laughs> and that's where most humans fall down. We, we, we hear them 
<laughs> hear the laws, hear the principles involved. You know, many people have heard what we've said for years and years. But do we really act upon these truths? So, so you can see from that too, the conscience is such that we don't have to act upon it. <laughs> we, we can just hear it and the, and the conscience can confirm the truth we, that we've heard. But at the end of the day, we still, God's not expecting us to do something about it. God's just informing us and allowing us to make our own choices and decisions. Yeah, so let, let's move on to really <laughs> defining what the conscience is because it is so poorly understood on. It's used in a different way. The word and the terminology and the, the concept is used in a different way to what you just started to allude to. So, exactly. So let's define it properly in our next section. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.